Welcome to tonight's presentation by Professor Elizabeth Croft, who I'll introduce in a little while. We are gathered on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge our first scientists, the Wurundjeri to our north and the Boonarong to our south, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And likewise, extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us here tonight. A warm welcome to you all. For those who are members of the society, you will have heard me say that I am the 71st President of the Royal Society of Victoria, which was established in 1854. And as you can read from here, I always get it wrong, we are promoting science in Victoria. <laughs> no, that's OK. <laughs> What did I say? It's a, down there it says uh, science since 1854, polar science since 1874. Oh, well, elsewhere it says promoting science in Victoria. That's what we're about. So I got it half right, but the year was correct. Tonight's function is a joint one with the Victorian chapter of, I know I'm going to get in trouble from their chair, but what I think used to be the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, etc., etc. But I'd like to invite their Victorian president, Professor Alexander Gosling, to join me up here and tell me about their academy and tell us all about their academy. Alexander. So let me start by asking you, what is the current correct name of the academy? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh dear. <laughs> um, a work in progress. Okay. The, the, the full correct name of the academy is the academy. Uh, well, I think the, the, the we're, we're really confused by this. We're, somewhere in there is the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, which is buried in corporate stuff. We simplify that to the Academy of Technology and Engineering. Um, but science is still very much at our heart. Uh, and, and tell us, at least we're on the same page, we're doing the same type of thing for the advancements of science in its broadest context for the people in our case in Victoria and elsewhere in Australia. Can you tell us a bit about the Academy? We are an Academy. Uh, we're a learning Academy. Um, our fellows are elected by the fellowship and approved by the board and then confirmed by the fellowship through a fairly exacting process. So the people who are the fellows of the academy, which means basically the academy, are people who are scientists and engineers and our focus is on the application end of science and engineering. So these are folk who, through excellence in science and engineering, have made a significant difference either in the ongoing execution of science or in engineering or in um, economic uh, impact and so on. So there has to have been clear, if I could put it broadly, e economic or how it's done impact. Um, we see our mission um, very much in line with David. Firstly, is the promotion of science and applied science in particular. Secondly, is applauding and recognizing those who've done well. And thirdly, acting as a source of expert knowledge and advice in that space, along with the other learned academies, as members of the Australian Council of learned academies who often work as a group for the government to provide objective, fearless advice on matters of science, technology and engineering and how they might impact the academy. So I think that um, sort of, if that satisfactorily summarises... Absolutely. <laughs> and how many members are there in Victoria? Uh, about two, uh, I haven't counted recently, yeah. uh, somewhere between 200 and 250, if anybody in the room knows any, but it's about that number anyway. Fine. And um, what type of events does the Academy hold? The Academy as a whole 
holds from time to time um, major events, um, which are national events. There's, for example, uh, the, the, there's uh, the, the Innovation Dinner, which includes the Clooney's Ross Award and various other awards <coughs> where we recognize in different elements people who have been excellent in the last year in that achievement. More locally, um, we have a monthly um, lecture plus dinner for those who want to stay on. The lecture is free and the dinner costs you the price of the meal. And <clears throat> I may say that this year our committee has decided that we would love to expand um, the attendance of those dinners, those lectures I should say, which are very much about the topic that we share interest in, which is successful application of science and technology for the betterment of the nation. Um, that's the common theme of our lectures and um, maybe I can discuss with you, David, how we can include members of the Royal Society in the invitation to those dinners. Would love to. You said for the betterment of the nation, but of course that means starting in Victoria, of course. Of course. <laughs> Where else would we yes. start? The natural home of yes. science and technology. So would you join me in thanking Alexander? Thank you very much indeed. And now for the main purpose of tonight, tonight's meeting. Our talk tonight features a much anticipated presentation from the new, that's last year, um, Dean of Monash Engineering, Professor Elizabeth Croft. In addition to her deanal duties or decanal duties, as mentioned here, I'm not sure which is correct, but I'll put both. Um, Elizabeth is also a professor in the departments of mechanical and aerospace engineering and electrical and computer system engineering. So as you can imagine, holding four professorships plus being dean of the faculty, she's got so much time, and that's why we really appreciate you coming to speak to us this evening. Before joining Monash uh, last year, Elizabeth held the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada's Chair for Women in Science and Engineering from 2010 to 2015. You can read in detail about her CV, but I often do this president's pick. I give the speaker a bit of knowledge, um, information beforehand. And Elizabeth, I'd like you to join me up here where I'm going to ask you a few questions about how you happen to be here tonight. Certainly. So from your accent and from your CV, I know you're from Canada. Where did you grow up in Canada? So I grew up in Vancouver, Canada. That's where I'm from. Right. And um, did you go to primary, secondary and university there? Yes. Uh, so I, I did go to uh, public schools, very different in, in Canada than it is here. No uniforms, which is cool. Uh, and, uh, and then I did actually do my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at the University of British Columbia. And uh, then actually before I went off and did postgraduate studies, I had a fantastic job. What was the job? I was did motor vehicle accident investigation. So I got to figure out who hit who, how fast they were going, who wore the seatbelt, who didn't, you know, all this sort of stuff. It was kind of like CSI before CSI was cool. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. So why didn't you keep in that area? Why did you spread your wings? Yeah, well, I had a number of influences, um, friends of the family, in fact, a, a professor of uh, mechanical engineering who was very keen on me um, continuing on with my studies, but also my husband told me that I shouldn't spend the rest of my life crawling under cars. I won't say did he want to do it, but okay. <laughs> so was there a teacher or a lecturer who kind of, you, you were there and you had a eureka moment? Um, yeah, there were, were a number of great influencers. I would say that my physics teacher um, was a huge influencer for me in um, telling me that I was good at physics. I didn't think I was very good at physics, but he saw that I, I was good at it and encouraged me uh, to pursue that. Um, I also uh, loved English literature, so it was a bit of a challenge for me in high school to decide between uh, engineering and English lit but uh, if you forgive me, I wanted a job at the end of it. 
<laughs> and so you did your undergraduate at UBC, mm -hmm. and after that? And then after that, the fun job uh, doing crawling under cars and, and doing accident reconstruction, and then uh, <coughs> went on with a scholarship to study at the University of Waterloo and the universe, then the PhD at the University of Toronto, uh, studying robotics. And following that, I was very fortunate to be offered a position back at UBC where I became a uh, industry chair in robotics. Is there, in your career to date, has there been one eureka moment that you think is the most significant one in your, uh, you've undertaken? Oh, there's been, <laughs> there's been a lot of fantastic um, opportunities. I think one of the things I, I've really learned um, in doing my studies, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about it tonight in my research, is how important interdisciplinarity is into really into discovery. And so some of the work that I'm going to talk about tonight is actually really influenced by the social sciences and by what psychology teaches us about ourselves and, and by extension about how we interact with robotics. And so talking, uh, talking to other researchers from other disciplines have been where those, those eureka moments have come from. Ladies and gentlemen, I am exceptionally delighted to ask Professor Elizabeth Croft to speak to us on social work, collaborative human-robot interaction. And in doing so, I'll hand the rest of the proceedings over to my colleague, Andy Davidson. Thank you, uh, Davidson. Thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh... I am going to talk about social work, but it's about humans and robots working together. And so, once upon a time, there were robots, and they were working alone in factories, doing their robotic jobs all by themselves, welding, putting in bolts, uh, performing all their duties. But there was one very important thing about those robots. They were separated by people. And that is where 90% of robotic devices are today. They're behind uh, guards and shields, and there's no people in this picture. And so in my world, I'm thinking about what is the future of robotics? Is it the Jetsons and Rosie? Or is it Terminator? And I don't like this picture, but I sure like that picture. So this is where, what we think about in how we develop human-robot interaction, the opportunity to bring robots into our lives to help us do the things that, are, that we would like to do, um, to, to look at things like home care, but also in the more complicated manufacturing applications, there's places where we would like for people and robots to get together and uh, be able to cooperate. And there's reasons why I believe now that this is possible. And, and we, one of the reasons is because robotic devices are certainly getting more humanoid and having more and more ability. So on the left, you see Jason, which is a robot constructed at the DLR, German Institute for Robotics. Um, that's the Robonaut I'm shaking hands with. Uh, we have actually a Robonaut in Australia, in Perth, with Woodside. Um, and then this is a Geminoid, which is a robot developed by ATR, by Hiroshi Ishiguro, which is a robot that's designed to act and look and appeal to people. I find it a little creepy. There's a whole other talk I can tell you about that. But uh, a hum very humanoid robot. When it gets really close to humans, so the Geminoid robots, that's when you start to really enter the uncanny valley. As long as the robot is um, more, uh, what would I say, if, it, if it's just an arm, then people aren't uncomfortable with it. But if it's an arm with skin and a hand and it starts to look, you know, more realistic, it's not good. Uh, people like the sort of cartoony shaped robots. Those things make it appear more friendly. Um, so. Yeah, it's the not quite right human piece that really pushes people off. And there's reasons why um, 
I believe that robotics is on to its next level. It's kind of going up the Gartner hype cycle. And, and that is because 3D print is, is a huge thing now. You can 3D print robot parts. And so that makes it possible for us to design all sorts of things that before took a lot of work to make in, in a machine shop. Sensing technology is getting fantastic. And actually, this is a slide uh, from one of my co uh, colleagues, um, Wenlong Chen in, at Monash, where he is making incredibly thin tactile sensors that are so thin that you can actually put them on with a Band-Aid and you can measure forces fairly, very accurately. So that's quite a quite exciting increase in technology. Of course, computational power, it continues to grow. And and that when we combine it with deep learning, which just let you know, deep learning is just optimization and statistics, okay? It's not magic, it's optimization statistics. But when you combine that with parallel computing, with faster and faster computers, you are able to do uh, much faster uh, optimization on data sets. And that allows us to uh, make decisions at a very fast speed. The other thing, of course, that's happening is uh, the internet of everything, the ability for us to connect ubiquitously in cities, uh, everywhere you go, pretty much you can pick up a signal now. And every single device that you can think of, you know, not just PCs and smartphones and tablets, but your fridge is now connected to the internet. So that ubiquity of connection and communication is also changing the, the, the way for robotics. And one of the things that's also really important to keep in mind is that robots need power. And so, Previously, you know, when we had lead acid and just nickel iron batter batteries, you know, you ran out of power very quickly. Even the lithium ion batteries, you still, you know, you can run uh, Spot Mini or Atlas for about 15 minutes while Boston Dynamics makes a great video. I love Uptown Funk. If you haven't seen it, Google Uptown Funk, uh, Boston Robotics. It's, it's worth the uh, YouTube three minutes. Batteries continue to get better, and as batteries continue to have more power, then um, we will be in lighter power, then we will be able to run robots longer. So all of these things are happening, and they are changing uh, the future of robotics, and it means that we will see a similar growth in the use of not only robotics in manufacturing, but also in robotics in our homes and in other applications. And Therefore, we need to think about how we are going to get along with, ro with the robots. I do think that rules matter. And so these are um, Isaac Asimov's uh, three laws. And as you can see, it's important that they're in a certain order, which is don't harm humans, obey orders, and protect yourself. Because if we have them in any other order, we end up typically with a kill bot hellscape. And we don't want that. So it's very important for us to think about how we're going to interact with robots and uh, so that we can have a positive future. And that means we really do need to think about people working ro with robotics. And so I do believe that the future is about how we design uh, robotic systems to cooperate in our world. And uh, that will lead us to a situation where we can think about robots helping us do manufacturing so that we can actually get into the space with a very large robot and feel safe. Because that Kuka Titan, it can take you out and that will hurt. Um, and we can also have robots that can, can be in our homes and allow people to uh, live where they want to live, when they want to live, and how they want to live. So we need to, to move on this. I think that there are things that we can get robots to do that allow us to do things that we would rather do. Because who really wants to clean toilets and vacuum? Not me, that's for sure. So being able to have that be done, um, I think that's where you want robots. I think there's also real opportunities, again, around delivery, also around telepresence, so that a ability to be somewhere else with a robotic avatar that can allow you to experience the place without being there is something that is 
going to save us a lot of airplane trips. So I don't think they've got telepresence robots right yet because it's still hard and clunky to use. But uh, as we learn how to have, how to control robots, but also how to have them navigate and share cooperation, um, that will improve, uh, that will be another really great application. So in my work, when I'm thinking about how um, we're gonna collaborate with robots, some of the things that we need to think about is some very, very basic stuff, like sharing. Sharing is very important. It's something that we learn in kindergarten. And one of the things about sharing stuff is being able to hand something from one person to another. So we need to be able to design robot systems that can hand over things naturally. Because if we can do that, um, then as I always say, I'd like to have a robot that my mom could have been able to use. Something that would just be so natural that she would know exactly how to use it and how to work with it. So we started our work looking at um, a whole bunch of different applications. Uh, so handing over a water bottle, uh, a robot here, which is handing a, a worker a part as they're assembling, or maybe working with a person uh, doing some kind of assembling task. And when each of those applications is, uh, is, is represented by this object and two people passing something. So what we ended up doing is start with the people. We got people to pass this object over and over and over and over again, and we plotted the data. So we really started robotics by looking at people. And what we realized is from this data, from plotting this data, which is basically the giver and the receiver, their grip force and their load force, what we saw is that the slope is, of course, the same, but the intercept is different. And what that told us is that the giver's uh, grip force, it's, it, that intercept is, is right here. It's a little bit positive. So when they're just before they're letting go, they're still hanging on a bit. What does that mean? They're responsible for the safety of passing the object. Whereas the receiver is when they take that load, then they're controlling the efficiency, how fast an object is being passed. So once we understood the rules of engagement, how a, a, an object should be passed, then we could encode those rules into the controller of the robot. And that's what I'm gonna show you now, is the difference between when you do not have um, those rules encoded and when you do. So, if you don't uh, encode those, code those rules and uh, you have someone come and try and take an object from a robot, it ends up being a bit of a tug of war because you basically have to pull it out of the robot's hand. Now that doesn't seem very friendly um, and it ends up being with the, the mechanisms quite jerky. However, when you use this handover controller, you end up with a very nice smooth and the wonderful thing about it is that even if you uh, uh, decide to hit the robot in different ways, if you use a displacement-based controller, um, and this is a very flexible robot arm, and you use a displacement controller, the robot will drop the object. But if you use, uh, uh, you do it based on human rules, on grip force and load force, then even if you push on the object, the robot will continue to hang on and to re-grip, which is very important. But when you want to go in and take the object, you can still have it let go. Okay, take the, take the object. There we go. Okay, so uh, that was uh, some of the work that we, we did just demonstrating how uh, 
how you could uh, pass things in, in what's, we, we use that in some other research that you'll, you'll see in a minute. Another question that we asked about, okay, how are we gonna live with robots, is about sharing space with a robot. So if you're in the kitchen and you're working with someone else and you're both reaching for something, there's this little thing that happens called a hesitation where you kind of reach for something and they kind of reach for something. And through observing each other, you ha have to make a decision about who's going to win. So how do, we, how do we do that as people? Well, we do it by these hesitation gestures, and the person that's more persistent seems to be able to win that. So could we use those same hesitation gestures that we've observed to negotiate around a solution about who's going to get the resource? And would it be helpful in, in doing tasks with a robot? So that's what we're really doing is think, thinking about what kind of human cues we would like a robot ha to have when we want to share space with it. So we designed um, by looking at how people interact. So we did a whole bunch of studies actually with card games, looking at people both reaching for the same card at the same time and looking at their gestures. And then we applied that learning to um, a shared parts bin application. Now, of course, here we've, we've made it fairly safe so the subject doesn't get, uh, uh, we're using foamy shapes and a, and a foam covered robot because we're worried about safety. Um, but you get the basic idea. So we draw, designed some gestures and some trajectories based on hesitations. And then we made sure that people understood them and then we used, a, used this with a numbers of subjects coming in and doing these, these tasks. And what we found is people were much happier to work with the robot when it had this uh, hesitation gesture, which looks kind of like this. So this is our base case, no collision avoidance. Oh, that's not looking good. And so this is what would a base case when the robot just Take, is, is not giving any kind of quarter, of course they would. So people don't like that. <laughs> the ro one would think that if the robot would just immediately stop, that would be a good thing, because then you would think, okay, the robot's avoiding me. But the problem with that kind of motion is that people get very confused by it. They don't know whether the robot's gonna continue. They don't know why it stopped. But when we use the hesitation gesture, people infer from the hesitation gesture that the robot has recognized them and that it's ceding control to them. And so the interaction makes it much more comfortable for people to use the robot. People are very comfortable with the more human-like motions. So that doesn't seem to create an uncanniness. In fact, that's more like a cartoon because it's doing that nice, um, calmly smooth motion that they understand. And so the understandability about motion does not cause, you know, an uncanny feeling. It's more the, the look, I think, that, that, that upsets people. So now we move on to, okay, we've got some gestures and some behaviors. How about if we tried to do some kind of assembly task with a robot? What would lo that look like? What would we want to communicate with a robot and how would we want to communicate that? So again, this methodology of understanding the task, um, studying how people do it together, developing the interaction method, and then validating that in a human robot team. And so the task we, we were looking at from an industry point of view um, was uh, a bin sorting task. And we simplified that into a shape sorting task because we're still teaching our robots and it's a little bit more simple. So we designed the task around handoff of, hand of parts and part placement and uh, common industry applications like turn taking and fastener insertion. And so in our human-human study, uh, what we wanted to do is just look at the ro what the robot could do. So we took away eye contact and we took away um, facial and sound 
and we just focused on the hands, what the, what the robot would be doing with the hands. So it's a simple task with no verbal and, and only gestural um, interaction. And this is what it looks like when pairs of people come in and do this kind of interaction. So we bring people in, and we tell them what they want to do, and we just ask them to make to come up with different ways of telling people, telling each other. And so they made these up. We just observed and saw what kind of motions they would do. So different pairs of people that we would bring in, and we they hadn't met each other, and this is the kind of stuff they would do. Then we took that forward. And we looked at the different kinds of communication. So in this particular talk, I'm going to focus on the part manipulation side, communications around things like moving parts, rotating parts, and give me a part. So we classified all of these different motions that people did in the wild, and we saw whether we could do the same thing and whether people would understand that when a robot did it. So would these gestures work when used by a robot? So this is what the human robot study looked like. So we would have different gesture samples where the robot would do things like point at a location, so hand over the part, and then point at a location. Please put it here. Thank you very much. OK, here's the part. Put it there. Now, I'd like you to get rid of this part here. Would you just make it go away? <laughs> and so here's, here's a really complicated one that we had a lot of trouble with because uh, it's hard, hard to gesture swap. But we were able to come up with something that people got. OK. Uh, twisting. Can you turn that one around for me, like that? Now, the interesting all, uh, thing about all of this, and this led to a different study that I'm not going to present tonight, is that <coughs> this only worked when we had one of my kids' floppy gloves on it. OK, the glove was not actuated, but we needed to have that um, green glove there, or people did not understand what the robot was saying. We also did another study where we looked at an actuated hand to see if it increased understanding. Um, it had some impact, but we got most of the benefit out of a kid's glove. So that's another interesting side effect finding. OK, so what are the results that we saw? Well, the blue is um, numbers, the blue is robot gestures. And the red is human gestures. And what's really interesting is that for many of the gestures, um, the communication did work. Uh, people recognized um, the, the robot gesture just as well as they recognized the human gesture. Some of them were more difficult, uh, where the, for example, uh, some of the remove ones and wave away. But for the most part, um, if it's a frequently used human gesture, then we can uh, replicate that with a robot gesture that people will understand. And in terms of easy, easy to understand, really, the gestures are, are quite easy and natural and easy to understand, and no different than the results for human gestures. So that was. Fantastic. We had come up with a way of, of talking with our hands with robots by studying people. The other thing that people use a lot is visual cues. Um, one of the things we, we realized is that when people hand things over, um, where they're looking um, also impacts uh, part of the cues. So when people are sharing a conversation, that looking and nodding is very important. So we wanted to ask the question about the importance of robots having heads, really, and having eyes. Does it have a value beyond um, just the you know being able to acquire visual information? So we did a study starting with people, and we asked people to to pass objects 
in, back and forth, and we didn't tell them how to pass them back and forth. We just got them to give and receive water bottles back and forth. And then we looked and we classified the numbers of different gay, different gaze cues that people used uh, when they were passing the objects back and forth. And we saw that there were really two different uh, uh, gaze cues that we could really um, identify. One of them is what we call the shared attention gaze. And that is when they take the object and they look where they're going to hand, hand it. And then the, the, other, the receiver looks to see where they're looking and they put their hand there. The other uh, gaze cue that we would see is people looking and then looking up at the person, like, I'm, I'm ready for you to take this. And so that's what we called the turn-taking gaze. So we took those uh, two, and then we added a control condition. And that control condition is what I like to call the teenager handover. <laughs> so that we made sure that we were comparing it to something that, would, that didn't involve uh, a visual cue at all. And so we invited uh, folks to come. Uh, we had 102 participants, which for, for robotic studies is actually a, a fairly large uh, group. It were, these were young people because we were doing this at a university and it was open day. Um, and basically we invited people to come and get a drink from our robot. Uh, so we had uh, th the three different uh, combinations. We had the no gaze or teenager handover. We had the shared attention gaze where the robot was looking at the handover location, and then we had the turn-taking gaze where the robot went from handover location up to, to making eye contact. And so this is what it looked like. Okay. So. I give you your bottle. So people would come in. Now, this, uh, this right here is a light curtain. So as people are reaching over uh, to get the bottle, we know basically when they've launched. And so, and we are also got uh, tra video tracking, so we actually know where they're picking up. And so this is that was shared attention, and now turn taking, where it goes and looks up at the person afterwards. And so we collected all this data of all the people coming and getting the uh, the different uh, water bottles, and then we looked at the data, which is the exciting part. And so the two things we wanted to look at were, one of them was about preference, so everybody filled out a survey afterwards. And what's interesting about preference is what we see is that people uh, certainly uh, prefer uh, the, so the, they, they, they prefer the attention, uh, the shared attention uh, one over, over all of them. And, uh, and sorry, sorry, yeah, they, 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 sorry, they cho chose turn taking over all of them because turn taking is the row. That's right. And then, so that's preferred. Um, they find turn taking also more natural and they find turn taking had a better communication of timing. However, so that's the one where I look at where it's going and then I look up at you. However, what was interesting, even though they preferred the turn taking, it was actually the shared attention one that got them to launch earlier. So this is when they started to reach, and this time here is when they took the bottle. And what we see is there's actually an earlier launch into going for the bottle when the robot is looking at where the bottle is. And that's, that's actually quite remarkable that that gaze cue has a measurable impact on the efficiency of the interaction. So even though they like the, the, the uh, turn taking better, this is more efficient. So that was a really interesting finding that 
ha that helps us think about, well, if we're going to do this in an automation sense, uh, in an automation application, it's very important that that cue of looking at where you're going to put that object is used. We've sort of developed a bit of a, a process for uh, understanding what the interaction should be. And so the first thing we do is this human-human trials, and it involves bringing a broad selection of people so that we are making sure that we're not sort of zoning in on a, a particular quirk of a type of person. You know, we want males and females. We want them from different age groups. We want them um, from different walks of life and different cultural backgrounds. So it does take um, the, you know, a lot of work to, to, to really understand what the interaction is so that it, it can be validated. Um, from there, we break it down and we understand actually the mechanics of that. So what the motions are, what the control is. And then we actually take those motions, prototype them on a robot, and then often what we'll use is something called Mechanical Turk with Amazon, where we'll display those uh, motions to people online, and we'll ask them to categorize them and recognize them to validate whether the motions that we're generating with the robot are actually valid, understandable motions. And then the last piece is then when we bring people back into the lab with the robot and do the experiments again. So it's quite a, quite a long process. Um, but that way we know that the data and the results that we have are well validated. Okay, so now we've uh, taken a, a lot of different looks at uh, robotics in, uh, in, in, in handover situations. Uh, this is a, a different application here. We're going to look at uh, what, what kind of cues and things we can do with robotics that are in pedestrian-rich uh, shared spaces. So how do, how do robots operate in a, a shared environment? And why are we interested in this? Because the robots are coming. Uh, we were actually working with Postmates, which is uh, one of the three uh, uh, last mile delivery uh, companies that's sort of coming up. You may have read about them in, uh, in uh, Wired Magazine or in other places. Uh, there's also Starship and Marble. So these are little robot carts that drive around places like San Francisco and, um, and Los Angeles, and, and they deliver I don't know, whatever you want having delivered in, in those locations. Um, and uh, what's the, what they're doing right now, actually, is they have remote control centers, and they're driving the ro people are actually driving those robots remotely. But what they're aiming to, to do, just like Uber, is to have the carts actually be able to drive themselves. And so what are the challenges in this environment? Well. Sidewalks are very complicated spaces. Like if you think driverless cars on, on roads are bad, well, there are rules on roads. You know, you can't just stop in the middle of the road, but you sure can stop in the middle of the, the, the sidewalk. And you've got, you know, talk about distractive driving. You've got distracted walking. Everybody's walking around looking at their phone. They're not, so it's a very, very challenging environment. And there's just stuff all over there. There's cats and dogs and pedestrians. And the social conventions and rules are pretty complicated. I mean, as a Canadian, it's like, oh, you guys are on the other side of the sidewalk, too. OK, yeah. Um, you know, so there's all these issues that, that come up. And intersections are a nightmare. So these are, these are the kind of challenges that, that robots into this human environment um, have to deal with. So we came up with this concept of, well, if I don't know where I'm going, what I like to do is to follow the crowd. So maybe we could use that same uh, idea of following the crowd for a robot, maybe in, in, in trying to figure out where you need to go um, and how to avoid things that are, that are on the sidewalk. You just follow everybody else and you would be able to do the right thing. So what does that look like? So here's our little robot. They found somebody. They're following them along, <laughs> off they go. 
Let's follow this guy. Oh, he stopped and he's looking at his phone. Okay, what do I do? Oh, there's another one. Okay, I'll follow him. He seems to know where he's going. Let's go after him. So that's, yeah. So we, uh, anyways, I'll, I'll continue on from there. So uh, one of the things that we found that was really useful about uh, this work is that instead of, uh, you know, robots helping people, we could actually get people to help robots. So it can get go this way. And one of the fantastic things is, um, in compared to using um, different algorithms to figure out how the robot should travel, we got much shorter paths from following people because people really are local optimizers and they love to cut corners. So it was fantastic to be able to use that. And the other thing that we found is that the motion of the robot as people observed it um, seemed to be more socially acceptable because they were not trying to do these straight you know, line things. They were just following the crowd. Um, so that was uh, a very helpful thing. One of the other things that uh, we're thinking about is taking this back into uh, the manufacturing environment. How um, can we uh, work with robots uh, in, the, in the manufacturing environment? And I don't know if you have had uh, an experience trying to program a robot. I, they're, they're not fun to program. And one of the challenges is that when you're trying to teach a robot how to do manufacturing tasks, you have to hold on to this big thing, it's called a teach pendant. It has a big red stop button on it, and then it has basically like a joystick. And you use that joystick to control the robot. So you're looking down here, and you're controlling something over there. That doesn't work, you know, and it's a painstaking task to set up set points um, to control the robot. So again, thinking about designing with the human in mind, and with the introduction more recently of augmented reality, how we could bring those thing, two things together to create a, a robot programming environment that would be far more suitable for, for people to use. So the idea here is that the user has an AR device and they are looking at uh, the robot that's uh, there, and they are basically design using their hands to kind of point to the robot, this is where I'd like you to go. Go over there. And so they draw in, in 3D space the trajectory that they would like using the hollow lens, and then they review a preview of how the robot's going to do that, and then they actually play that on the robot. So that was kind of the idea of what we wanted to achieve. So here you can see uh, what it sort of looks like. The student has generated a virtual path, and then they are going to edit it, move the points around, and then they are going to preview that path, and then they're going to execute it. Of course, we're still doing this with soft fuzzy toys. So why do we want to do that? Well, really because, not because I have small little robots and uh, soft fuzzy toys in my lab, but actually because I want to help uh, people that are using very large robots. And also, when you have these cases of trying to do things that are very complicated over large spaces, want to bring in the uh, ability to do manufacturing and, and composite layup and things like that over large spaces, um, have people involved and have very large robots involved. So what does that actually look like? So this is the case study that we're looking at. We have um, a bunch of people that are trying to lay, well, they are laying up, um, a bulkhead for uh, for an for an air air cone. Okay, so they're they're basically creating this big composite fiber disc, 
And so what you do, it's kind of like making a bed. You lay down all of this different carbon fiber, you cover it with a plastic sheet, you suck out the air, and then you have to hang on down, down there, and this guy is smoothing out the wrinkles. This is not a fun task, okay? So the idea is, well, how could we do that? And initially, um, our partners uh, at DLR thought that they could build these beautiful big grippers that would just smooth everything away. Um, so when I visited them, I got taken down the valley of death of grippers. They had designed all of these fantastic things for moving the, flat, the, the plastic and the, and the fiber around, and none of them worked. And they basically said to me, I think we figured out that we need to have people help us. We can't do this all with a robot. So could you help us get um, people and robots together and be able to do this task? Because it is pretty complicated, even when you have a very small part. As you can see, like I said, it's like making a bed. And there's a lot of smoothing and sliding and taping and... We don't know how to get a robot to do that. So what we're imagining to do is, again, to be able to point to the robot, I'd like you to make a smoothing motion there, and then have the robot be able to do that task for you. So even if it's very far away, <laughs> you would be able to draw a line and go there, 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 and of course be able to edit it, Say, well, that wasn't so good. Could you do this line instead? And then the robot would go and do that line for you. And another feature of that is you can also um, increase and decrease the length of those arrows to make the force larger or smaller just by pulling on the arrow itself. So that's, that's kind of the things that we're going with. What we've learned is that, uh, and this is again lots and lots of user testing, is that um, for between using a kinesthetic interface and the, the uh, visual AR interface, is that some things are much easier to do, um, like pick and place with the old method, but some things are actually uh, become much less, much faster. So using AR, we can um, pick and play slot faster, do line array slot faster, and the physical, the physical workload for pick and place um, and erase or, or to move the, move the uh, robot back and forth along a line uh, becomes quite, quite a bit smaller. So that's a, that's a benefit that we're starting to see. But this is ongoing work, so, so stay tuned. So I think... What I'd like to say is that if we think about designing robotics um, in the context of things that can do to help uh, people, and if we focus on the people in the design instead of on the technology, then I think the future can be very friendly and much more like Rosie and maybe much less like the Terminator. And that's my story for you today. Thank you very much, Dean Croft. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Just wondering if you've thought about having the actions which you've sort of got at the moment, in a sense, pre-programmed or um, they're, they're in the code or hardwired into the robot, if you can look forward to the time when you can get them as emergent phenomena so that, you know, there's a sort of consciousness or self-awareness in the robot that brings about the behavior you're looking for, but yeah. not by pre-programming the behavior? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's pretty, a pretty interesting question. So what I think is what we need to create is um, a set of building blocks. So if you think of language, there's phenomes, and then there's words, and then there's sentences. And so with the early work that I showed you, sort of the passing of objects, the controller, the handover, the hesitation <clears throat> gestures, I think those are the early things that we would um, 
we would teach kids how to use, you know, t kids learn these early things. And so doing that is kind of bootstrapping that learning onto the robot. Now, I now have a PhD student who's looking at, well, now can we take these different bits of, of, of behaviors and uh, identify or, or have a robot learn which pieces of these behaviors can be joined together in a sentence to create an object. And can we do that not by programming as, a, as you say, but actually by observing a human teacher? So the idea of watching somebody, you know, say making breakfast, getting the bowl, adding the cereal, adding the milk, can we we you know break that down into activities and then allow the robot to learn that and and, and from little from pieces of behavior the challenge i think of coming to the very baseline of learning to to um uh to start at the very baseline is it's very very slow because you spend a lot of time just building up this behaviors um, so you want to kind of bootstrap it, which is why I think it's very important to, just like we teach kids how to do things, we need to kind of teach robots how to do things rather than leaving them all by themselves to, to figure it out. If we want things that we feel are designed to operate in our environment, because there's no guarantee that um, uh, an optimization that's done by a neural net or another deep learning algorithm will necessarily come up with um, an optimization that's desirable for an interaction with a person. So I'd like to keep the human in the loop. Thanks for coming to speak to us, Elizabeth. Um, my question was um, a bit more of a philosophical one. Um, it seems like a lot of um, the, the sort of motivation uh, that underpins the development of these brilliant systems is a drive towards efficiency. And I can understand how that makes sense in, um, you know, where there's a commercial dimension to the application of the technology. But I wonder what your thoughts are on um, where sort of a, a drive towards efficiency takes society and what the role of scientists is in, you know, shaping the kind of society that we want in the future. Well, first of all, I guess if we think about that, um, the horse has left the barn. And the horse left the barn, you know, 50 years ago when we started with computing, right? We don't go so much to the bank anymore. I get online and I pay bills. And that's pretty, pretty efficient. And I don't think any of us want to go back, right? I don't think that, you know, the, the, the job of the bank... Uh, person sort of, you know, making ledger marks was particularly a fantastic job. And I think that uh, when we think about uh, the future with automation and the future with robotics, what we're thinking about a future is not that we're replacing people, that, but we're shifting work to work that is more um, interesting and intelligent. And, and the fact is that um, when I think about countries like Australia and, and I think about Canada, I think about the fact that if we want to maintain the standard of living that we, we want to have, um, we're going to have to work smarter. And that means that we're going to have to figure out how to use automation in a way um, that allows us to do the things that we want to do um, in a more efficient, and, and in efficiency in a lot of different ways. I mean, efficiency in using less power, efficiently see in terms of using our resources better, and automation is actually a way to be able to achieve that. So I agree that um, uh, we, we want to be mindful and thoughtful about how we're using automation, but I, I don't think we actually have, I, I, I don't think that we have a choice to not do it. I think we have a choice to do it well. And that's why I think when we think about how we uh, design our automation systems, I always want to design with the interaction with people in mind. Because if we do that, if we think about what it's for and who it's for, and how we're going to keep them safe, and how we're going to keep um, the environment that we're operating in in a safe environment, then we're, we're, we're doing the right things. We have to think about those consequences. But to ignore them, it's not an option. 
I'm going to use the stage prerogative to ask a question to follow up on the efficiency question. Yeah. Because during your presentation, you were talking about that surprising result where the efficiency yeah. was higher in the... Yeah. Uh, do you have any data or observations that led you to understand what caused that efficiency increase? Yeah, I do. Or at least I have an intuition and it's something that we've... Uh, we've been following up in different ways. I think the thing is that when um, when we were doing the turn taking, and I mean, I'm delving into psychology now, so I have to really kind of go back to my psych friends and say, is this really true? But we will do more more experiments in this area. But well, I think what's happening is when you're focused on the object, there really is an efficiency uh, gain because you're just focused on the work. When you make eye contact, you also take away some of that efficiency because you're you're focused on the relationship mm -hmm. and so you know uh, when you're when you're doing something do you want people focused on the work or the relationship it depends right if it's the barista handing me coffee then probably I do want to design that robot to focus on the relationship because there is something about that. But if it is in terms of getting a job done efficiently, then I probably want to focus on the object. Or if the object has certain value, you know, it's an expensive, fragile object, or I'm doing something that's intense like surgery, I don't want to make eye contact, I just want the next object. Yeah. Um, you've shown us very well how to design robots to simulate human motion and uh, human behavior. How far away are we for simulating human thinking, logical thinking? Oh, so now we're going <laughs> yeah. The reason I ask this is that someone the other day talked about law. And it says law was a good candidate for using robotics mm. because it hasn't changed in 300 years. Mm. Mm. And it would be an ideal thing, seeing it has got so much data available, for a robot to find that information and make logical decisions. Okay. Okay, so... Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to my, my earlier comment about machine learning and explain again that machine learning is not magic. It is optimization and statistics done on fast computers, right? So it's really driven by a very simple gradient descent optimization. That's basically, now it's done in parallel and the, you know, the work by Hinton and others, it's something that I studied uh, many years ago. It is fantastic and it's a very efficient way of um, connecting relationships, right? And so if you have a lot of data, it can learn those relationships very, very quickly. What we haven't been able to do as well with machine learning yet is understand um, or have machine learning explain those relationships. It can learn the relationships, but it cannot yet do a good job of explaining. So I guess the question is, if you want to learn something that you have already uh, set up a set of rules and you're satisfied with those rules and you want to draw out that that is that's good but keep in mind in data the biases of what you've always had will stay in that data so if you have data that's biased the system will be biased um, if you want a uh, it's very hard to get unbiased data because the world is full of biases. So if you want to learn new knowledge um, you, or in, and you want to come up with you know, reflective thinking, you don't want to use machine learning. So I guess the question is, do you have common law or Napoleonic code? Because if you have Napoleonic code, I think we can use machine learning. But if you have common law, then we're out of luck. <laughs> Thank you for an excellent talk, Elizabeth. About 30 years ago, I did a postgrad in robotics at Monash, and my field of interest at the time, having been in engineering and mining and a variety of other fields through Caterpillar, was upsetting my tutors and the 
professor there, of handling explosives with a robot and doing my presentation, bringing in um, inert explosives which were looking like they're real and trying to put a detonator into one of those on campus was, to say the least, a bit worrying for the, the staff. But it was already been pre-told. But the one thing was I had a fixed um, explosive and a movable arm trying to insert the detonator into the cartridge. Mm -hmm. The processing power back then was shocking. T sensors were shocking. Today, I'm looking again, I'm still playing with that a little bit, looking more at the comment you just made on the sensors, the very fine sensors look promising. But this interaction and the handling between a human and a, and a robot, I'm suddenly thinking laterally that I could do that with these with two robot hands, one moving the detonator and the other moving the cartridge because that's what a, um, an, explo an elderly explosives gentleman is doing. It's not just fix one and fix the other. There, yeah. There's that interaction. So what you've brought up is a whole new wow. <laughs> well, I'm delighted that's happening. In fact, uh we're uh, we are actually looking at that. There's a whole bunch of, of work now on two-handed robots, and we've um, have some two-hand armed robots at Monash. Is a really interesting part that coordination. Of course, now you're going from seven degrees of freedom to fourteen degrees of freedom. So there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting problems to solve, but. Uh, uh, we are just uh, recruiting some fourth-year project students uh, who are, are willing to take up the challenge. Thank you. So with the uh, robot following people mm. example you gave, yeah. the second person it followed seemed to be very uncomfortable. They did the whole, I'm speeding up my steps and um, okay, sort of were, thing. It was, the, the whole video was sped up a bit, so it was because... You know, otherwise you have to sit there for a long time and I'd feel bad. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about how they're, how they're feeling that. There were a lot of different experiments. That's kind of the best of demo that we take to IROS and show off. Not necessarily the, the, uh, the most natural one. I was just actually curious as to whether you got any, like, more negative responses, like people going, Oh, that yeah. kind of thing. Oh, yeah, no, people do. People, you know, actually, one of the reasons why we are very interested in this problem is that um, it's a bit of a transient introducing uh, these robots into the environment, right? Because people are confronted by them. Some people um, really don't like them. In fact, well, some of the discussions that we've been having with uh, companies like Postmates is, you know what, you got to make these things look really friendly. Look, they got to look like My Little Pony. Because um, people have different reactions to them, right? And so the friendlier you can make that thing look like, you know, you make it look like a pink unicorn and probably it'll be fine, right? Um, although, there was a really interesting bit of work done by um, some fantastic colleagues um, at the University of Waterloo with Hitchbot. And it, it's just sort of an interesting social study, which this was a robot that basically didn't do a lot, but the idea is they left it on the side of the road with a sign saying going somewhere, like going to Vancouver. Um, and people would pull over, read the sign, put Hitchbot in their car, and Hitchbot would be recording this whole thing. And so Hitchbot went from one, one end of Canada to the other <laughs> and back again on the goodness of friendly Canadians. Um, then they took Hitchbot to the States. And they tried the experiment again. And it got mugged in Philadelphia. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. So it is really important <laughs> that you... That you do, uh, so obviously some people found it confronting or whatever, but that you do understand how people are feeling about this new thing that you're introducing to their environment and whether it's making them feel comfortable or not. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I was wondering to what extent you found that the gestures were culturally specific. I mean, you mentioned that you work with colleagues from around the world yeah. and whether you notice differences or whether you tried it out in different contexts. So 
Some of the things are definitely not culturally specific. So handover, those rules for handover, those rules, uh, that, that handover controller is used on, on robots all around the world. So we've released it into the, the Ross library. And when I go to conferences, I, I pick things up. Oh, that's got my controller on it. Nice. And so, you know, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Dutch, French, they're all using it and it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, I do think that, uh, that probably there are certain um, uh, gestures uh, that are uh, definitely not, uh, not acceptable. And actually, some other work we did with the fingered robot when we were trying to, you know, basically, I have a paper where my robot's giving the world a finger. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Because for some people, that, that's a pointing finger. <laughs> So, and so, yeah, there are different things where that, and, and so we did, but we did find that with the pointing and, and sort of telling people what to do, because it's dietic, because it's pointing at things, and it's um, about the object, so it's about the affords to the object, and of course, the great thing at being, well, the great thing about being in Monash, which is very similar to being at UBC, is... Uh, you've got the world at your doorstep, right? So you can recruit, you know, and have a Iranian student sit down with a student from India and then have a student from... So we had a diverse group of people. And, um, and yeah, when it, when it comes to tasks, there's sort of, you know, you know what you're going to do with the screw. You're going to turn it this way or that way. I mean, it's just whether you can use right hand or left handed. Most screws are right handed. Um, so they're those kind of those kind of things are are very common the um, the ones that are more uh, which I didn't show it in this lecture are the ones more about uh, communication like okay or or things like that which are much more culturally specific I had a question um, in, a, in a similar vein um, it was less about um, robots that deal with sort of discrete tasks like, you know, turning screws and that sort of thing, but more to do with um, some, of the, some of the more complex applications like the um, delivery uh, yeah. robots. Um, a couple of, maybe a year or so back, um, we had introduced into Melbourne um, O-bikes and it oh. became pretty clear. Um, Nobody liked them. Yeah, within, <laughs> within a short sort of time frame that we can't have nice things. Um, they ended up in, you know, the Yarra yep. River, trees, yep. all that sort of thing. I wonder how we go about um, the journey of sort of bringing people on board with new technologies like this and, and making sure that, you know, these innovations can actually be, you know, hit the ground and, and yeah. sort of be realized. Um, I think they actually, failure is a good thing and it happens a lot. So there's been a number, actually over the last year, um, we've said goodbye to, to Jibo. That was sad. I don't know if anybody, you had a Jibo, but Jibo was this absolutely adorable little little robot home companion that um, came out of the MIT Media Lab, and it just didn't make it. There was another one that came out of uh, Mayfield, Mayfield Robotics, which was part of Bosch, and, and it didn't make it either. So, you know, there are these failures. Um, there was a great article uh, by Guy Hoffman recently about these failures. And we learn from them. So I think it's I think it's okay for these things to fail because we're going to learn probably more from the failures. Um, it's better if they don't all end up in the era. But uh, I think that's part of the journey of any technology. Think about the Newton. Does anybody remember the Apple or the, the mm -hmm. remember the Newton? Mm -hmm. It was a fail. Mm -hmm. But it's a fail that's in, you know, the museum in, in, uh, in the States, right, in, in Washington. You know, it's, it was what we wanted, but we had to, we had to iterate. We had to, to get better. Computer technology had to get better. The human user design had to get better. And then we had the palm. I had a palm. I loved my palm. But nobody has palms anymore. The iPac, mm -hmm. all of those things. So it is an iterative journey. Um, if we don't try, if we don't try these things out um, and we don't experiment, we're not going to innovate. And, and I think it's really important that with young people coming and, and trying these things out, that it's okay for them to fail, that it's okay to take a risk um, and see how it goes.
Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to close. I'm going to close the questions for the evening. Thank you very much for your interest. It, it's a fascinating day that we had this talk on, of course, um, from the, the theatrical side of things, from the fiction side of things. We lost Rooka Hauer today, who's very famous for a soliloquy on his death in the film Blade Runner, um, which really forces you to turn your mind around when it comes to AI. There's a lot of talk and fear about artificial intelligence and what effect it's going to have in society. And that movie, and particularly the soliloquy, really turns it around to make you start to become empathetic to what's going on in the mind of a sentient being that, that isn't human. So I thought it, it was really interesting that this talk landed on this day, which also happens to be in the same year that the character that Rukuhawa was playing died. So uh, a fascinating set of coincidences. But thank you very much for, uh, for coming to us tonight, uh, Dean Croft and presenting a, a fantastic uh, series of studies. I'd like to call on the audience to, to give a vote of thanks. We don't know where it's really going to go. What we do know is that we need to design around what people's needs are, what they will accept. And we do know that when we go into different cultures, there will be different levels of acceptability. Some people will be very happy having robots in nursing homes, and other people will not feel comfortable with that. Um, I think if the outcomes are better for the people that use it, then we've done the right thing. But, you know, it's got to be up to the people. <laughs>